Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, uh, I'm Stuart Schechter. I'm here to introduce Leo Bauer from Carnegie Mellon. He'll be speaking to us about access control. Thanks very much. Uh, do we have any, any clue how many people might be or might not be watching remotely? I'm, I'm just curious. No? OK, no, it doesn't matter. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, this uh, system we have at Carnegie Mellon called Gray. And the basic idea in Gray is that we're using smartphones as the vehicle by which users exercise the authority. And in particular, in a particular scenario, this authority is to, to uh, access office doors, delegate to each other the right to access, to, to access each other's office doors, and also log into computers, log into each other's computers. Um, but just to, to, to roll back a little bit, this is uh, stuff that's, that's well, this slide is now almost a couple of years old, or a version of it is a couple of years old, and I think. A couple of years ago, we had to do much more selling of, of why we were interested in smartphones. And I think now everybody is much more excited about smartphones. So not, not so much motivation is needed there. But uh, I mean, one fact that perhaps bears repeating is that huge numbers of mobile phones are being sold. Right? So last year, 1.1 billion fo phones were sold. And in a couple of years, it'll, be, uh, it, it'll definitely be the situation that every mobile phone that's sold will, for all practical purposes, be what today we're calling a smartphone. Right, so in a, in a few years, we we're looking at a world where practically everybody on the planet has at least one of these powerful mobile computing devices and is walking around with them. So we might as well find some cool stuff for these devices to do. Um, and, and what we want to do with the phones is use them to intelligently control the environment. And Gray is sort of the, the current version of Gray is just the tip of the iceberg in that in that sense. I'll show you a couple of scenarios that uh, we'd like to enable with Gray. One is. Suppose we were doing access control to vehicles with, with the phones. Then something I'd like to make possible is if I'm on a vacation and a friend of mine wants to borrow my car, which I left at home, I'd like to make it possible somehow for some interaction to take place between my phone and my friend's phone so that there's a virtual transfer of credentials from my phone to his, and he can just use his phone to, uh, to drive my car for as long as I've decided is appropriate. Another example. Suppose we're using uh, these devices for mobile commerce, right? some sort of mobile payments. Something that would be really neat is if a friend of mine uh, walked into a store and noticed something that he knew I really wanted to buy, it'd be neat if I could send him the money so he could make this purchase on my behalf without having to lend me any money. Uh, another example, suppose I'm traveling, there's this important email exchange uh, going on. Something I'd like to enable is uh, that my secretary get access to that email exchange, but only to that, only to that thread or only to that set of threads and only for a specific amount of time. And moreover, I'd like to do this in such a way that uh, I don't have to give my secretary any usernames or, pass or passwords that she might be able to use to access my other accounts or that I might have to change afterwards or anything of that nature. Uh, and final example. Um, suppose, I'm, again, I'm traveling. I've made my hotel reservations, all my travel reservations online. A scenario that I'd like to make possible is that when I walk into a hotel where I've booked a stay in a city that I've never been in, hotel I've never been in, I'd like the hotel infrastructure to transmit to my phone uh, perhaps a map of the hotel and directions uh, as to how to get to my room, as well as the authority to open, unlock my, my room door and keep unlocking it for the duration of my stay. And in all these scenarios, uh, something that unites them is that there's a kind of virtual transfer of authority going on between, uh, between devices or between devices and infrastructure. And this should be completely seamless and transparent to the user, regardless of whether it's happening within, between two devices that are in the same room or two devices that are, in, are on opposite sides of the planet. Um, so that was sort of the, the more, more the grand vision of Gray. This is uh, concretely what's happening with, with it right now. You, what you see here is a map of the second floor of a building at Carnegie Mellon where, where I work. Uh, all the circles are doors that are gray, uh, gray enabled. The green ones are ones where we're using gray. The red ones are ones where, well, gray could be used if, if we wanted to activate it. And here the idea is that each door is outfitted with an actuator such that the phone can, communi can communicate with this actuator via Bluetooth. And if the actuator is convinced that the owner of the phone should be able to gain access to, to the office or to the lab or whatever, uh, 
then the door will unlock. Okay? And beyond that, what's, what's possible in this, in this setting is that users can um, delegate authority at the time and place of their choosing. So if I decide that my students should be able to get into my office, I can do stuff on my phone which will create credentials and enable them to get into my, my office. And this can happen both pro proact proactively in the way that I just described or reactively. That is, somebody can attempt to access a resource. The system will discover that the person doesn't have authority to access the resource. And then it will go seek out people who might be able to modify their policies in order to make this access possible. So we've had this deployed, various versions of the system for a couple of years now. We usually have about 35 users, 35 doors. And we also use this, although less extensively, for logging into XP, Vista, and, and, and Linux. That is, we have a little module, a little uh, plugin uh, on, the, on, on these various OSs such that the phone can be used to unlock a screen or log a user into the computer. And we're starting, oh, we've, we actually started a, another deployment of this at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. So, let me describe a scenario that, uh, that's a pretty typical one that takes, takes place uh, in the context of our system. Here we have two players. We have a student, Scott, and, and myself, and my office door is the, the, the resource that uh, somebody will want to access. So here the idea is Scott wants to get into my office, uh, and the only way he'll be able to get in is if he can convince my office door, or rather the little computer Im embedded in the wall next to it, that I've authorized the access. And now, in this scenario, I'm traveling, and so I can't somehow directly uh, authorize this access. Um, my phone here holds a bunch of credentials. These credentials represent pieces of my access control policy. Um, some of these pieces are, for example, that I have stated through a credential that I think students should be able to, or my students should be able to get into my office. I've stated that people that I believe are faculty should be able to get into the office, and also that for all things uh, having to do with CMU, my secretary has full authority to speak on my behalf. But importantly, uh, for the example, there's no subset of credentials here which enables Scott to get into my office. In fact, none of these credentials even mention Scott. So here's what happens. Um, Scott tries to instruct his phone to open my door. The door sends back a statement of the theorem that Scott's phone must prove in order to demonstrate that, that, that I've authorized this access. Now, Scott, in this, in this example, has no credentials, but he realizes that this is something, this, his phone realizes that this is about accessing my door. In fact, there's something about that stated in, in, in the statement of the theorem. And so it turns around and asks my phone for help. Now, my phone can help because it has a bunch of credentials, uh, and a, a bunch of credentials, but in the particular case that, that, that we're looking at, these credentials don't yet enable Scott to get in. However, my phone can, using those credentials, give me a list of uh, new credentials that I, could, that I might be willing to create, such that any one of these new credentials, in combination with all the ones that are already there, might be sufficient to give Scott access. Right? So here I pick whichever one I think is most appropriate, which is that Scott is a student. This, uh, this means that now there's a collection of credentials sufficient to to, to, to answer Scott, and these get, these get shipped back to Scott. He adds one of his own uh, and uh, sends them to the door. The door opens. Now, what's going on here under the covers um, is that in each one of these cases when I'm sending credentials to Scott and Scott is sending them to the door, so what's being sent is a bunch of digitally signed credentials. These are the things that represent pieces of the access control policy, and they're wrapped up in a formal me mechanically verifiable proof, which explains how these credentials together imply that I, I've, I've authorized this particular access. Right? So I won't go into this in detail. I don't really want to argue the point, but we believe that there are a couple of neat things about this approach to doing things. Um, one of them is that after um, one of them is that after uh, an access is allowed, this proof can easily be put in some sort of uh, record. Right? So when you're auditing accesses, you know not only that somebody accessed something or even all the credentials that were involved, but you have an exact explanation as to why the access was allowed. And this might be interesting because, for example, a piece of the explanation, which also uh, could be uh, uh, the result of a, of a number of credentials. Could be, for example, that the, the HR department was one of the entities that allowed access. Right? And it's neat that you can just pluck this piece of information out of this proof instead of having to try to interpret these credentials to see if they imply something like that. 
Uh, another neat feature is that in the limit, this allows the, the reference monitor that's checking proofs to be, uh, to be relatively simple. Right? It doesn't have the complicated task of figuring out why access should be granted. It just has the task of figuring out whether an explanation as to why access should be granted is, is a valid explanation. Um, and to help convince you that this actually works in reality, I'll show you a two-minute video which basically replays the scenario that I just went through. And here, um, my uh, developer Dave is playing the part of Scott, but otherwise it's the same scenario. So here you see Dave walking up to my office. I'm not there. Uh, I think he'll be pretending that this is the first time he's accessed my office, and so he'll use his phone to take a picture of this two-dimensional barcode, which encodes the Bluetooth address of the, of the computer that's embedded in the door. So now his, he instructed his phone to open the door. The door communicated back what the policy was. Uh, his phone realized that it couldn't uh, compute a proof, and it offered him an option as to whom to ask for help. Now, there's some automatic guidance, but there's also the ability for the user to direct the request in the way that he's, he thinks is most, uh, is most useful. So here I am traveling ostensibly, but actually in a conference room on the other side of the floor. I get the request, and this uh, little wizard interface helps, uh, helps me choose which additional pieces of access control policy I want to create in order to make this access possible. And here you see uh, I'm adding... Uh, I'm adding Dave to uh, a group that I've already created in the past. Interestingly, this group already has other credentials granted to it so that Dave will be getting not only the authority to get, or get into my office, but also the authority to do other things that members of, my, my group are allow member members of this group are allowed to do. So as soon as I'm done creating the credentials, my phone assembles this proof from them sends it back to Dave. Uh, Dave turns around and, and sends a bigger proof to the door. The door opens. How yes? Communicate? Bluetooth network uh, wireless? Yeah, so they, 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 they communicate over what's essentially a uh, homegrown version of multimedia messages. So uh, one phone uploads stuff to a server, and the other phone gets an SMS telling it where to go pick up data. You guys own a server. It is. It is. Uh, well, the server isn't doesn't belong to the cellular provider, but the data is uploaded via whatever data connection the nice. cell provider offers, nice. and the the other phone is poked via an SMS. Yeah. All right. So there are a uh, a bunch of research challenges and really a bunch of research directions that we're exploring uh, in the context of this project. One has to do with developing better logics for access control that will uh, let us describe um, a number of interesting access control scenarios that perhaps some older logics couldn't, um, couldn't uh, let us handle. So um, one such example is in the case when we want to control access to uh, consumable resources. Right? So if you think about digitally assigned credentials, usually they, they have uh, an interval during which they're valid. But the intention is that they can be used within that interval as many times as somebody likes. Right? However, suppose you want to give out a credential saying, I'd like to give you one can of soda, or I'd like to, to have access to one can of soda. Right? So I, I don't want this credential to be used many, many times. I'd like it to, to be usable exactly once, otherwise it loses its meaning. So we did some work that enabled uh, scenarios like that. We also did a little bit of work uh, to enable scenarios where um, the, uh, we, you perhaps might have multiple organizations using a system like this, uh, and the organizations cooperate to the extent they're all willing to play in the system, but at the same time they're independent enough that each organization wants to use its own access control logic. Right? So now there's the question of if I'm trying to, if the resource is housed in one organization but my home organization speaks a different access control logic, is there any way I can convince this resource that it should open? And so we figured out a, a, one approach to, to doing things like that. Um, a, another class of, of issues had to do with uh, distributed theorem proving. Right? This, uh, this, this task that Scott's phone engages in, or Dave's phone engages in, in order to demonstrate that it has uh, access is essentially a distributed theorem proving task. Right? It has to, from credentials or, or premises available at various places in the network, it has to uh, figure out how, it's, how it can be demonstrated that, uh, that it has access. And some of the things that make this more difficult, well, beyond just uh, 
the distributed, uh, this distributed factor, is that many of these credentials don't exist. For example, in the scenario that you saw, uh, the, credential, the credentials, uh, the hypothetical credentials, which my phone showed me and allowed me to pick which one I wanted to create, right, these didn't exist until the theorem prover suggested that maybe they were good ones to create in order to, to compute this theorem. Um, another piece of work has to do with helping users configure access control policies. And this is, this is one of the things that I'll talk about today. Um, this has to do with um, easing this burden of configuration. Right? In this situation, they've had to wait for a while while I picked what policy to create in order to let him into my office. It would be nice if somehow the system was smart enough to minimize the number of situations where uh, a user had to incur a latency of that nature. And finally, and I, I think this is really a critical piece of the puzzle in developing access, new access control systems and one that's, that's often overlooked, is I think it's important that once you come up with a system that you think is cool and new and useful in, in some way that previous systems aren't, you really ought to be able to demonstrate that in fact, compare it against some previous system or compare it against what people want, the system in practice provides some usefulness. Right? It doesn't matter, maybe your system has really awesome features, but when you deploy it for some reason or another, it does, does nothing useful. It's less useful than whatever people used before. So uh, we did some work in that vein. And these are the two, two things I'll talk about today. Um, but if you if you'd like to discuss any of the other matters, I'd be very happy to talk to you about them offline. All right. So, um, right. So the first part, the first of the remaining two parts of the talk will be uh, trying to solve the problem of how to make it easier for users to configure policy. Um, and again, the, the very specific, this very specific issue we're trying to, to solve here is in the situation where I always knew, or maybe at, at some point I knew that, uh, that uh, I would be willing to let Dave in, but I never got around to implementing this policy that I had in mind, right? And so as a result, Dave had to wait for, for perhaps a minute or two or perhaps many hours because I was in a plane uh, and wasn't able to create a policy uh, before, before he was able to get into my office. So I'd like to do away with latencies like that uh, whenever possible. And the approach we took to solving this has two pieces. One is try to figure out what the intended policy is, that is the, the policy that somebody had in their head, right? Compare it to the implemented policy, the policy that's been operationalized in the system, and figure out where the mismatches are. And then suggest to the user that he fix this, these mismatches if we think that they're indi an indication of, of misconfiguration. Um, the, the thing that makes this possible is that, that um, access control policy exhibits patterns. And more specifically, if you have a collection of access control logs, you can mine these logs to, to extract those patterns. Right? And these patterns are indicators of, of what's, what's good policy. Now, one thing that really needs to be highlighted here is in order to be able to do something like this, well, you actually have to have a collection of logs to analyze. And this is something that a particular device in this system on its own wouldn't have. Right? You, ac you actually have to go to some effort to, to come up with this, uh, this comprehensive collection of logs. So once we have those logs, though, what we do is we apply association rule mining. Now, this is a technique which, um, it's an algorithm which takes a, as input a set of records which, where each record has a fixed number of attributes. For example, uh, you can think of a, uh, of a record as being a shopping cart, and the attributes are the contents in the shopping cart. And so, so the set of possible attributes is the set of items that the store sells, and the set of attributes that is, that is true for the shopping cart are just the ones that are inside it. And the output of, of uh, association rule mining algorithms is a set of rules that really describe the statistical patterns that are observable uh, from these records. For example, a rule might be that uh, people who buy peanut butter and jelly also buy bread. And now the way we use these rules is to identify anomalies. So we see somebody who has bought peanut butter and jelly, but not bread. Well, maybe this is a mistake. Maybe if most people buy bread when they buy peanut butter and jelly, but this person didn't, maybe this person really intended to buy bread, but just a plain forgot. And so we can suggest to this person, do you also want to buy bread? And incidentally, this is also, uh, this plays a role in how, how uh, items are organized on shelves in, in grocery stores and other stores, right? They, 
the, the people who stock these, these places try to make sure that uh, the items that you buy together always live together in part in, on a shelf in part so that when you're buying one, you, you notice the other and remember to buy it. Um, going into this in a little bit more detail, here's an example of a record with, uh, with four attributes, just two attri four possible attributes, only two of which are actually true in this record. So we have a set of records like this, and then we can begin looking at combinations of attributes. For example, if we look at attributes A and B across all records, we see that, well, uh, in four times it's the case that attribute A holds, and two times it's the case that attribute B holds. So we can say, well, uh, we can make up a rule saying that the existence of attribute A implies the existence of attribute B, but with confidence of, of, of 0.5, right? Because the rule is only supported in some sense by, by half of the evidence. Similarly, uh, there can be a rule that, that attribute A implies attribute C with a slightly higher confidence because it has slightly, uh, slightly more data items um, supporting it. So how does this translate to, to users and doors? Well. Uh, each record becomes a user, and all the attributes of that record become the resources that that user has been observed to have accessed. So what this line about Alice means is, this, is that Alice has been seen accessing resource A and resource C. Right? And so now we do rule mining uh, on this data set. So for example, if we come up with a rule that resource, accessing resource A implies accessing resource C, then this one instance where that rule doesn't hold, if it's a high quality rule, a high quality rule is likely a potential misconfiguration. Right? So maybe, maybe this is a mistake in the sense that maybe Bob soon will be accessing C even though we haven't seen in the system any policy that uh, allows Bob to access C, maybe he will and there, therefore maybe such policy should be created. So we tested this on a, a data set that we collected from our deployment. This data set, data set was collected over 16 months, contains about 11,000 uh, accesses using great various doors on our floor, uh, 25 users, 29 resources. Um, right, just a piece of terminology, the, um, I'll use this terminology of a policy matrix, which is one of those, uh, one, uh, a matrix kind of like you saw on the, on the previous slide. And there'll be two kinds of it. One is the uh, implemented policy matrix. That is, it'll be constructed just from the things that occurred in the log. There'll be another kind which is, goes beyond what occurred in the log. That is, we actually gave out a survey to users and asked them, you know, if such and such a person asked if they could access your office, would you allow this access? Right, so through that we got a richer uh, a richer matrix than the intended policy matrix. And these were the two against, against which, we, uh, which we evaluated how well we could, how well we could um, uh, guess. Yes? Some uh, computers were stolen as a result of this uh, Right. Laptops. What happens if, if we make wrong guesses? Yeah, because you can allow some access which you don't want to. Right. Uh, right, and um, this is this is a very interesting point. Uh, we, we've had some very lively discussions on this topic. In that, for example, I, I I feel that if the computer was doing it was correct 90% of the time, I'd be okay with that, and I would just let it do let it do its thing and trust it. Most people strongly disagree, and so what we do in the system is that. Uh, as a result of, of a guess, the, the computer interacts with the person. So it doesn't create policy. It talks to a person and say, well, it seems like maybe this policy would be useful. Do you want to create it? So that speaks to, to the concern that you voiced. So the, the way we tested this is um, using a uh, simulator. And the simulator sort of replayed all the accesses that were seen in the logs. So at every iteration, it would use the, the access it was curr currently looking at to uh, extend uh, the access matrix that described all the accesses that were seen so far, right? So this represents all the accesses that were seen so far in the system. Then we would do a rule mining on on that it, that access matrix. This would generate rules, which would we would use to make predictions again using this access matrix. And then we would the way we we would evaluate these uh, predictions is to compare them to the ones in either the intended or implemented policy matrix with just two different two different types of comparison. Here I'll just speak, I think, about the intended one. Uh, so in this case, uh, because this final matrix, in fact, showed that this access 
was was given or would have been given, then we say, well, this is this is a good prediction. There are a couple of metrics we use to measure our success. Um, the most natural ones are accuracy and coverage. Right? So accuracy is of the predictions we make, what percentage is correct. Coverage is of the accesses that um, that will take place. How many can we predict? Right? And we measure we measure these with respect to. Here I'll just talk about with respect to intended policy. You'll see a particular uh, particular parameter being varied in all graphs, and that's the minimum confidence of the rules being used to make the predictions. I mentioned that the rules could have a confidence depending on how, on how much data supported them. Well, if the rules are very very low confidence, we just plain don't use them. So this this min conf is the threshold at, at which point we start using rules. So um, what seems to be missing in those two metrics is that you could have uh, uh, you could have low coverage, but it turns out you've covered every case that eventually comes up. So there's lots of cases where when you ask people, well, in theory, Bob access yep. resource, yep. they say, well, sure. Yep. But the fact that, uh, the fact that it, it never actually happens means they've got a simpler rule in their head yep. and life's just better because, it, uh, because Absolutely. it's never actually going to happen, but that doesn't seem to be covered by those two uh, Right. So, so well, really, that goes into whether we're comparing against intended policy or exercise policy, which is exercise policy is the the policy that we see at the end of at the end of our, our data collection, right? So, the, does that make sense? So, but the survey doesn't get intended policy. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. Absolutely. So, the survey gets uh, gets sorry, the survey gets intended policy. The exercise policy would come I from. I thought the survey was getting what they would, who they'd want to allow, not who they believe they allowed. Was it uh, should see. should this person be allowed to access, or did you give this person the ability to access? Right. So okay. The question being asked. Okay. Okay. So we distinguish between two things which are similar but not exactly the same that, uh, as what you're asking. So we distinguish between intended policy, which is the policy people said that they would create if asked and exercise policy, which is the policy that was observed by looking at the system over 16 months. Okay. All right. So the exercise policy is which accesses actually happened in the system. Right. And, and you're right. Had these people created policies? So all of the exercise policy, uh, right, all of the accesses happened because somebody created policy to allow them. Yes. brought you access to my office, but maybe you never used it. Right, and that's, that's the one that falls through, through the cracks in this particular version. We're now doing stuff which takes that into account. Um, I don't have results for that here, but the general nature of the results is the same, if, if you're willing to trust me on it. Yeah. Yes? What, what happened is you have a real record. Yes. It's, it's not in dispute. Mm -hmm. Well, the intended policy is something vague. Right. But what would I do if? That's right. That's right. So, so, so you compare something well defined with something which is vague. It's a uh, well. It's all right. So it's. I would say, it's not vague in the sense that we ask people specific questions, but it is absolutely true that the way they answer these questions might be different from what they might do in reality. Yeah. So and this is a source of impreciseness. You're right. Did you have another? I think it's just a linguistic confusion. I think what you're talking about is an ideal policy. Because, so it, it's intended if you say, in retrospect, did you mean to give this person access to that? Okay. But it's ideal if you're saying, would you want, right? Is your, your, there's my ideal policy, uh -huh. and then there's what was I intending when I created the policy. So, yeah, I think that, that what you're calling ideal, I'm calling intended here. Right, okay. Yes, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, can what you learned uh, from the, the log uh, be, uh, how can you uh, use what you learned from the past uh, to improve the mm -hmm. future when users are making a choice and uh, mm -hmm. the system will make an error? I don't see the connection. Sure. Uh, and, and I should have, I should have uh, given a more concrete example. So here, the idea is, suppose that um, uh, Alice, Bob, and Charlie both all accessed um, door one, right? And Alice and Bob also accessed door door two. Now, so we have a situation where it seems like 
most people who access door one also access door two. And it could be the case that Charlie also will access door two. Right? And so we ask somebody, will Charlie need to access door two? It seems like other people who are accessing the things that Charlie accesses also access door two. Would you like to extend policy in order to make it possible for Charlie to access door two? Does that uh, answer your question? Okay. Okay. And, and so, well, I, I guess just to, to connect the example to, to what I was talking about, the, the fact that Alice, Bob, and Charlie access door one, and, and Alice and Bob access door two, that's what we observe from, from, uh, from the access logs. Right? And so then we crank this rule mining crank, and it tells us, well, it seems likely that accessing A implies, or accessing door one implies accessing door two. And then we apply that back to the matrix and notice, look, Charlie accessed door one but did not access door two. Maybe, maybe this is something that ought to be made possible by creating more policy. Uh, OK. So I'm a if Charlie never requires the, the access, mm -hmm. why is that a problem? Um, right, so the, the, it's a problem because we'd like to eliminate situations where Charlie doesn't have access the moment he requests it. We'd like to make it the case that if Charlie is going to request it, the policy will already be created before he requests it so that he can access with no delay. All right, so what we're trying to get, of, get rid of is, is delays like the one in the, in, the, in the demo video where somebody, Dave, had to wait in front of my office while I created a new policy. Right? And while in this particular case the delay, delay was short because I was able to pay attention to my phone immediately, it could well be the case that I'm asleep or out of, you know, on a plane or, or for some reason unable to pay attention to my phone, in which case Dave wouldn't have been able to get into my office for a while. And of course with access to my office that might not be such a big deal, uh, but you can imagine needing to get to um, data that's critical, like, I don't know, patient records or a server room where a server is about to overheat or something of that nature. Uh, but, but actually, uh, your example about the doctor <laughs> would, I mean, it reminds me about a counter example is that, I mean, the doctors may have a lot, share a lot of common access rights, mm -hmm. but uh, I guess uh, one doctor shouldn't have access to another doctor's patient's uh, mm -hmm. file. Sure. Something like, uh, if they, even they share a lot of, uh, a common access right doesn't mean another one should uh, get uh, the access right. Uh, that's right. That's right. Ads. And so, well, let me go on a little bit, and I think part, at least part of your question will, will be addressed. Yeah. Um, right. So accuracy and coverage, uh, completely unsurprisingly, here at MinConf, this threshold is is being varied on the x-axis, on the y-axis is uh, prediction accuracy, right, from zero to 100 percent, as well, and as you use rules that have more, more support by the data, well, the, they are more accurate, right? No, no particular surprise there. Um, and also, if you think about it, not very surprisingly, oh no, so, okay, sorry. So here to your point about some rules aren't, aren't a good ind indicator of policy. So there are situations like doctors do lots of similar things, but then in some places they also do different things. So what we do is we add a feedback mechanism, that is, as I said, as a result, as a, the result of, the, of a rule, the system interacts with the user to ask if the user wants to create more policy. Now, if the user listens to the rule, we mark this rule good in some way, and I won't go into the details. If the rule, user does not listen to the rule, we mark the rule as a bad rule. Right? And so uh, in this way, we penalize rules for not being useful, we reward your, your rules for being useful, and eventually we stop using rules that haven't shown themselves to be useful or that, or that have shown themselves to frequently be incorrect. And in this way we can improve the, 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 the quality of our predictions to some degree. Now the, the old li line is this lower one, the new, new line with, with feedback is this, this bigger one, and here the difference is actually, I don't know, it's about 30% better for, for, for a range here. Um, also, not too surprisingly, the coverage, that is the number of accesses we're able to predict, decreases with the, the confidence as, as the, the, the confidence of the rules grows, right? This is because there's a very small number of rules with very high confidence. So even though they are very accurate rules, they only result in a very small number of predictions. And so 
coverage can't be very high. Yes? I'm just trying to understand this graph. You're saying if you have no confidence, if you have no evidence that uh, a user is going to want to change policy, there's still a 50% chance that they'll say? Uh, right. In, in particular, due to the way that, that uh, the system was. I mean, I, I don't, yeah, so I don't know about the zero point, but just to the right of the zero point, we started off with such a small user population and such a small resource population that, in fact, you could randomly guess pretty accurately. Right? When you got to, 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 when you went through the first, I don't know, 50, 50 accesses or so, then this was no longer true at all. But at the very beginning, it, it did happen to be true. So this and are these adding, are these for rules for giving additional permission or also for removing permission? So these are just rules for giving additional permission. So, so in theory, it could just be that 50% of the time, if you throw someone a random name and said, would you want to give this person access, it, it, they'd say, yeah, sure, why not? It could be the case. It could be the case, yeah. Uh, it's not, but it could because be. Because people are, are going to feel like they... Just to say no, they have to have some justification for why they don't trust that member of their lab. Yes, yes. And, and actually, to some degree, I will address the question of what kind of policy people created in, in the second part. Okay. Um, but what's important here is that there's, there's, there's some area of, uh, of parameters, some space of parameters, where we can achieve decent, well, for, for some definition, decent, uh, decent accuracy and decent coverage. That is. We can make correct guesses most of the time, while at the same time predicting most of most of the policy. So the next question is: Once we make a guess as to to how policy should be changed, how can we figure out who is the right person to change it? Right. So, in a system with a single administrator, this is trivial because it, there's one administrator. You just ask the administrator. In a system with many administrators, this is uh, a little bit more difficult. Uh, you don't want to ask all of them because, well, you'll be asking a whole lot of people and uh, at probably at most one will be answering. Uh, so they'll, they'll get annoyed. Um, so what we do is we uh, also log, log not only who accessed what, but also log who helped in this asking. And then we come up with a, a bunch of strategies for, uh, for contacting users based on, uh, based on how they have helped in the past. So we... We have several strategies. One is we ask users who helped when other users asked this, asked that, accessed that resource, or we accessed we help we ask users who helped the same user, but when he was as accessing other resources, or the union of these, or the union of these plus anybody else who happened to have accessed ha happened to have accessed this resource in the past. And again, uh, we run this through a simulator in order to evaluate how well it works. Yeah, the simulator starts out as before, except now the logs also include information about how misconfigurations were previously, uh, previously uh, resolved. Um, notice that this information, a lot of this information can also be extracted from the proofs. Right? If you actually look at the structure of the proof, you can sort of tell uh, who, who could have come up with that proof or who contributed credentials to that proof. So first is the step, same step as before. We identify misconfigurations, then we construct from that and the logs of who helps resolve misconfigurations, we construct a list of candidates that might be asked to help change policy. And then we ask, we ask uh, any of those candidates. So here we, we have a couple of different metrics. Uh, one is uh, the success rate, that is the number, the percentage of correctly predicted misconfigurations that can be re repaired, that is for which we can figure out who's the right person to ask. Um, the second metric we have is the number of high latency accesses we save. Right? So I said the, the goal is to save these high latency, to, to, to lessen the number of these high latency accesses when somebody's stuck in front of a door waiting for policy to be created. And so we'll just count for the, uh, for, 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 for the data that we have over 16 months, how many of those high latency accesses that occurred would not have occurred if you were applying, uh, if you were applying these methods. And finally, this is an interesting one because so we're changing the kind of user interaction that's going on. Right? Previously, the only kind of user interaction be, uh, between the user and the system was either you are creating policy or you are, um, you are accessing a door. Right? But now there's a new kind, which is the system proactively asks you, do you want to allow somebody to do something? Right? So we're wasting user's time. And we wanted to see how much user's time we were wasting in comparison to how much time was being uh, 
saved by the person who now uh, could enter immediately instead of waiting. So uh, this is on the x-axis you see different strategies. On the y-axis uh, you see the success rate. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, the, the three different bars within each strategy indicate whether we asked just the first person in this ordered list or the first and second person or everybody on the ordered list. And what, what, what shows up here is that occasionally there's some difference between asking, the, between, between asking just the first person and asking the first and second. Right? It, it occasionally helps to ask the second person, but it actually very rarely helps to ask, uh, helps to ask beyond the second person. Right? So if you just ask the first and second person, it seems like that's the optimal point between uh, getting somebody to answer you but not, not bothering people too much. Sorry? What's the total set of potential admins who could do this? Uh, the total set of potential admins is, I guess, the same as the number of users. So it's either 25 or 29. I forget which it was, yeah. But like, I can't set the policy on Lori so. Well, actually, you can, right? Because if Lori gave you access, then somebody else could ask you whether you wanted to let that person in. Yeah. Um, so this is the, the graph that, that uh, shows how many uh, total high latency accesses we saved. This is, again, uh, the con uh, confidence threshold of the rules that we used. Here is just the, the, the number of accesses that occurred in the system. So this red line is our baseline. This is how many high latency accesses actually occurred in the data that we observed. Um, and for, for some particular reasonable selection of parameters, we can do away with 44% of these high latency accesses using, using the techniques that I described. Um, finally, with respect to the user interaction time, that is how much total time everybody involved spends uh, interacting with the system. Uh, well, first of all, this is really extremely specific to our particular system, right? Because each system will be very different in this respect. To give you some sense for uh, how, much, how much time various events took, um, when a user was waiting to access a resource, the time it took for access to be given ranged between, well, 25 seconds and 18 hours. I mean, clearly at the end of 18 hours, this person wouldn't have been waiting anymore. Uh, but the, the median was uh, 98 seconds. And the average time a user spent repairing a misconfiguration, that is interacting with his phone when the phone asks, do you want to do allow X, is, is 23 seconds. So these numbers are, are how the following graph is produced. And again, here, the X axis is the th confidence threshold of the rules. The uh, Y axis is the total, no total amount of time all users spent interacting with the system during this uh, in, uh, during this, this, these 16 months in, in, in hours. Uh, so again, red, red is the baseline. Users, in reality, spent something more than 2.6 hours interacting with the system. And for a set of points um, that are the result of how, how long people would have spent interacting with the system, if you were using these prediction techniques, what you see is that uh, the total, total interaction time would have been less than it was in the, in the real system. So uh, the way we read this is, well, first of all, it's nice that we were able to do, to do away with 44% of the high latency accesses. But what's, what, what's more, we were able to do away with many of those high latency accesses without increasing the total amount of time that people spend interacting with the system. Right? Because there was a danger that, yes, we saved some high latency accesses, but people spend 10 times, 10 times more time overall interacting with the system. Right. So. Uh, the summary of this part is, uh, for some reasonable set of parameters, we can uh, substantially reduce the rate of high, high latency accesses while also reducing the total interaction time or not, not affecting the total interaction time much and identifying a large percentage of the, of the um, uh, misconfigured policy. So something that we've, we've discovered sort of since our initial results was that this is actually the results work reasonably well even if you pull out a bunch of users. So if you pull out 20% of the users, the results are actually very similar. Um, if you look at performance over time, it's also reasonably stable. So it's not the case that I mean, there's some initial period of, of uh, 30 accesses or something like that during which performance there's no performance to speak of. But after that, uh, predictions are reasonably accurate from, from the beginning to the end.
Any questions on that before I hop on to the next part? Yes. Just, uh, I've been thinking about this concept of uh, intended or ideal policies. Mm -hmm. have, have you looked at asking people the question in two ways? One, uh, which, of these, which of these people would you exclude from this door? And the other, which of these people would you allow access to this door? And seeing whether the, what, what the baseline effect is there? I, I, I think that's an excellent question. Um, we haven't done that. So I, I, I concede that the way in which we collected what we called intended policy isn't, was not amazingly scientific. Um, I'm sure that there are many specific inaccuracies. Uh, I don't have a feeling that, that it was wild, wildly inaccurate in the sense that people would have always given much more access or always given much less access. But I, I, I don't have a scientific result which would say this. Mm -hmm. The problem is scaling into sophistication of policies. Mm -hmm. So for example, when um, the telephone tells me the list of people, so, so suddenly I know who is responsible. Mm -hmm. Maybe not a friend, maybe an enemy. Okay. Suddenly I know who is responsible for this resource. That by itself may be a secret. Yes. Or, yes. for example, when I delegate something, the delegation may be only, say, the next person, but not the first. Right. It doesn't That's have right. to be transitive. That's right. That's and right. then policy may depend on all kinds of uh, uh, conditions, time, and position. You know, if you do records, mm -hmm. then just, it, it seems that it works in this simple situation. Right. Well, yeah, so, so uh, I agree that policies could be a lot more complex, and that would, that would complicate matters, certainly. Um, in terms of the data set on which we're basing the predictions, it's, it's not policy, but it's, it's accesses. Right? So, so a lot of the policy complexity would get lost, would get erased before then. There's still the, the issue of um, uh, privacy, and that we just plane haven't addressed yet. It's been on our to-do list for a long time, but we haven't, haven't gotten around to it. Yeah. So it definitely might be the case that I'm willing to, to give, give Stuart access to my office, but there are some other people that I don't, don't want to know that. And so for, right now, the system doesn't implement any safeguards which would prevent these other people from accidentally learning that. Yeah. Anything more for now? All right, this part will be quicker. Um, so this was the part where we tried to, um, uh, well, we, we tried to provide some just justification for all the features that we included in the system. Right? And every system design become, be, uh, begins with some intuition on somebody's part that here's some set of features that's interesting and people will find useful. But we actually wanted to see whether when we built a system, let people use it overall, did they gain something through using the system or not? And, and there were two particular uh, questions that we want to answer. One is, um, so we built a system. We'd like to know exactly how well does it match the user's needs, right? The users want some stuff. We believe maybe that they want some other stuff. So we built a system to match what we think is cool. Let's see exactly how well it works for them. Uh, the other part was uh, somewhat to address a criticism that I've often heard, which is that if you allow uh, delegation to happen very easily, what you'll end up with is a world where everybody is delegated to everybody else, and hence everybody has access to everything, and so you have no security whatsoever. And so we were really curious to see whether that's how things would, that would play out. I mean, my intuition was that it wouldn't, but it's a valid scientific question. Um, so let's see. So when I speak about a policy for, uh, for the next several slides, now I will talk about a policy being a tuple over a, uh, a principle like Bob, a resource, like Alice's office, and a condition under which this person can access that resource. So true means that this person can always access uh, that resource. Um, we, we conducted a study here uh, where exam we examined the access control policies created by eight people who had resources for which they could control the access control policy. A lot of the users in our system were, were users that didn't, didn't own any space and therefore weren't really necessarily empowered to, to give out access to it. But so we studied primarily the people who were able to uh, give out access to their space and then all the users who, who actually um, 
made use of, of, of the policies that these people created. Um, here we have a slightly larger set of, of accesses than, than, uh, than previously. Previously we had 11,000, now we have almost 20,000. And a, a key thing that we try to extract uh, here is the ideal policy. Um, to introduce more potentially confusing uh, terminology. So this is the, the policy that people would want to, inter uh, want, want to enact if they weren't restricted by, uh, by technology. So uh, this, this is something that was actually quite, quite hard to extract from users. And in general, it, it's, it's data that, that it's very hard to come up with because when you ask a user but what accesses he would like to make possible, sometimes he just plain doesn't know. Other times his thinking is guided by what he knows is possible because he is controlling access using keys or prox cards or whatever. And so it's really hard to get the correct answer. So uh, we think we came up with a, a very good approximation of the right answer. But the reason we were able to do this is because we periodically interviewed users. We interviewed users, in essence, uh, I think every two weeks or every month over a long period of time. And so initially, we asked them what were all the things that they wanted to do. And we did some probing to figure out if their answers uh, were somewhat consistent, but then we compared that to, to what we've, we observed them doing in practice and we always would go back to what they originally said and we would try to, again, we would, we would try to make sure that, that, that the, the answers they gave were consistent. And often, often they weren't, so, and so we would revise what their, intended, uh, their ideal policy was. Um, and then we, we, we put this together in this, this humongous graph of what was everybody's ideal policy. Here's just a piece of it. Uh, essentially says things like Gary is always allowed access to Charlie's lab or Frank is allowed access to Charlie's lab only if the access is logged or Joan is allowed to access to lab only if the lab owner is notified and Mary is never never allowed access to the lab. Now the what was interesting is this this set of conditions that we identified as conditions under which people were willing to give access right so there was the false which is never give access to true trivial Logged would mean, would mean that somebody would want to give access only under the condition that they could have a record of the access after the fact. Uh, and they, these were kind of interesting. This was uh, willing to give access, but only if, I were noti if I'm notified when the access takes place, that it took place. This is that I'd like to be consulted in, in real time. That is, at, I'd like to be consulted at the time of the access to figure out if, if I want to give it or not. And these are our sort of extensions of that. So again, I want to be consulted at the time of access, but also somebody has to be present to witness the access. Right? And I'll trust the third person to make a real-time decision and to, and to witness the access. And so with these conditions, uh, you can immediately see that um, various systems might not be able to implement these conditions. Right? If you're using keys, you can't implement logging or owner notification and so on. If you're using gray, well, you imagine that logging is trivial. Something like real-time approval also works because I talked about that, but we happen to forget to implement owner notification because we, didn't, we only afterwards discovered that it, that it was useful. So now that we have this list of conditions, uh, we can look at all the rules that were created using, yeah, that, that exist in the ideal policy, as well as in the policies that people enacted with keys by, by giving keys to people, or with gray, by creating credentials in, in gray. So now what we did is, we compared policies, not, not accesses. We actually compared the policies implemented in the various systems to each other and to the, to the intended policy. And we counted false accepts, false rejects, and, and faithful implementations, where a false accept is a situation where the uh, condition implemented by the, by, by the real system is in some way not as strict as the ideal condition, versus the false reject is a situation where the system in practice is implementing what somehow is stricter condition than the ideal condition that the, that the user desired. Right? And so we just, uh, the, the, the way we make the comparison is we count up these numbers and, and compare them. Um, just a, a more concrete example of uh, false accepts and false rejects. So here is a situation where the ideal policy uh, is for Alice to have, always to have access to the lab. The way to implement is to give Alice a key and we, we assumed, we, we, we took this as meaning that the, the policy was faithfully implemented, right? Those, the condition of having a key is approximately as powerful as the condition of, the desired condition of having access anytime. Now, on the other hand, if the ideal policy was that, uh, that the owner should be notified when the, when the lab is accessed, and again, the policy is implemented by just giving somebody a key, well, then this is a false accept, right? Because this condition of giving somebody a key is 
not as strict as the condition of requiring uh, owner notification, right? This just does not implement owner notification. But the key was given, and so this is a false accept. Right? And finally, uh, a false reject is a situation where, and we had some of these where a user really wanted access only if logging would take place. And this was so important to him that since he couldn't have logging, he denied access. Right? So we say that this is a false reject because the reality was that it's always a rejection, even though sometimes under some condition the user wished for to allow the access. So here we have a graph by ideal conditions. So the, the various ideal conditions are on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the number of policies uh, in each condition. And now this is, this is uh, for, for keys, right? And green indicates faithful Im implementations, and yellow and red false rejects and false accepts. So what are some interesting things here? Um, Sort of as you would expect, keys don't do well with logging or owner notification or owner approval, right? The, the errors are sort of split into false accepts or false rejects because if people wanted the condition but not so strongly, then they gave a key anyway. If they really wanted the condition, they, they didn't give a key. So in one case, it would be false accept, a false, and in the other case, it would be false reject. This one is really interesting. Um, you would think that when people didn't want somebody to have access, that would be easy to implement with keys. But that turned out to be not the case. And, and when we looked at it, into it a little bit more deeply, I think in general it turns, turns out with keys not to be the case. So what happened frequently is that um, people wanted to give access under specific circumstances, or they wanted to give access to a group of people. Right? They wanted to make sure that a group of people could sometimes get into a machine room. And since it was too complica complicated to create a bunch of different keys, and hand them out to everybody and then, then sort of do revocation of keys when people left and so on and so forth. What happened was that one key, one key got created and it got hidden somewhere on the floor where various people could access it. Right? And then everybody who, who, who might need to access it was told where that key was. Right? And this happened a bunch of times for a bunch of different resources. And the result was that now this hiding place had keys for a whole bunch of things. Right, such that anybody who needed any of the keys in that hiding place had access to all the other keys that maybe they didn't even know what, what they were for. Right? But certainly they had access to them. They, they could use them to get into other resources. And so this led to uh, a large number of false accepts when people wanted to deny access. Right? And, and this is actually a very conservative number. We counted the false accepts in, in, uh, in various ways depending on how certain we were that, that somebody could get to the key. So this was, this was the smallest number of false accepts. When we were more liberal about interpreting false accepts, the number was just ginormous. Um, so this was keys. Now comparing keys with gray, uh, a couple of interesting things. So, so this is the one that I mentioned. Owner notification is something that you can imagine that in gray with, we could implement very easily. We didn't think to implement it. And so it wasn't here in the study. And so, well, we just all of those policies for us were, were, were false rejects. Um, owner approval is something that Gray could implement easily right, through this, this reactive delegation feature. And so that didn't work with keys, but works well in Gray. And, and perhaps most importantly, all the situations where users inadvertently had access in our, in, in, with keys, it turns out that the policies that, are, that were implemented in Gray were such that people did not inadvertently get access. Right, so that, that, that perhaps was the, the most interesting result here. So to summarize this part, um, I think one of, the, one of the interesting contributions is that we document this collection of ideal policy data, which is uh, really pretty difficult uh, to get. And we developed the metric for um, talking about how accurate a particular set of policy is, policies is and comparing different sets of policies implemented by different, uh, different systems. And then finally, with respect to gray, uh, we were able to show that uh, gray was both less permissive than keys, and it uh, was more accurate at impl implementing the, the user's ideal policies. That is, it was more accurate at implementing the policies that, uh, that users wa wanted to have. So in fact, it was not the case that in a situation where you could, or at least in this particular situation where you could delegate very easily, it was not the case that everybody delegated to everybody else. In fact, overall, fewer people had access to things with gray than they did uh, using keys. Uh, my last slide. So uh, gray is this platform that, that I really like as a vehicle for experimenting both with neat things we can do with mobile phones and, and in particular with a logic-based platform for distributed access control. 
there, there's a particular set of things that, that, that we've, uh, we've studied so far. But I, I think something to, to take away from this too is that the, the various things we've done in this context, they don't apply necessarily only in this context, right? So everything that I've talked about, I've talked about in the context of mobile phones, but you can really apply this technology in situations that have nothing to do with a mobile phone, right? You can do access con distributed access control in this way on the web or in IT systems or you know, certainly some other environment. Yeah. Um, all right, and that's all I had. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Okay. Thanks.